Live from New Delhi, you're watching DD India News, our India's voice to the world. I'm Ramesh Ramachandran. Coming up in the next hour. Germany's airline Lufthansa suspends flights to Tehran. West Asia on alert for potential threats from Iran. The US bows ironclad support for Israel. US, Japan and Philippines to hold their first trilateral summit with an eye on countering threat from China. Japan and US announce stronger defence ties. Asian Development Bank raises India's GDP growth forecast for the current fiscal to 7%. Investment and consumer demand to drive the robust growth. And India celebrates Eid al-Fitr, marking the end of the fasting month of Ramzan. Prime Minister Narendra Modi greets people on the occasion. Germany's Lufthansa suspended flights to Tehran because of the situation in West Asia as the region is on alert for possible Iranian retaliation over a suspected Israeli airstrike on Iran's consulate in Syria. An Iranian news agency briefly stoked tensions further when it published an Arabic report on social media platform X saying that all airspace over Tehran had been closed for military drills. The agency then removed the report and denied that it had issued any such news. Lufthansa said it suspended flights to and from Tehran from April 6 until probably the 11th of April. There was no immediate word from other international airlines that fly to Tehran. Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei said that Israel must be punished for the Damascus strike that killed seven Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps members. In an apparent response to Khamenei, Israel's foreign minister Israel Katz said on Wednesday that Israel will mount countermeasures if Iran attacks Israel from its own soil. Meanwhile, the U.S. Central Command in a statement said that its forces had successfully engaged three unmanned aerial vehicles launched from Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen over the Gulf of Aden and Red Sea. There were no injuries or damage reported by the U.S. coalition or commercial ships. The U.S. forces also destroyed eight UAVs in Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen later on the 10th of April. Amidst this, U.S. diplomat Brett McGurk had called on the foreign ministers of Arab countries to deliver a message to Iran urging it to lower tensions with Israel. Iran's foreign ministry said on Wednesday that the foreign ministers of Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar and Iraq spoke on the phone with Iran's foreign minister and discussed regional tensions. Israel will open a new land crossing into the Gaza Strip designed mainly to facilitate aid deliveries from overseas or neighboring Jordan to Palestinians. Israel's Defense Minister Yuav Gallant said a new crossing point would be created on the northern part of the Gaza border to reduce the time taken to truck in aid from Ashdod. Israel has gradually reopened two established cargo crossings and created a new crossing on its border. Last week, it also announced to admit Gaza-bound aid shipments at its southern port of Ashdod. Israel has also helped set up a maritime corridor for direct deliveries of aid to Gaza by sea and opened its airspace to foreign planes that have parachuted in aid for the Palestinians. Hamas chief Ismail Haniyeh insisted that the death of three of his sons in an Israeli airstrike will not influence true stocks in Gaza as operations on Thursday rocked the Palestinian territory. Israel confirmed the killings, which came as talks in Cairo for the temporary ceasefire and hostage release deal drag on without signs of a breakthrough. Israeli military described the three sons as operatives in the Hamas. 
Speaking to a Qatari-based broadcaster, Haniyeh suggested that the strike, which also killed four of his grandchildren, was an attempt to shift Hamas's negotiating stance. Haniyeh is based in Qatar and is the face of Hamas's international diplomacy. His family home was destroyed in an Israeli airstrike in November. And joining me from Tel Aviv is my colleague Alex Caddy. Alex, is an Iranian attack imminent? Well, that's what we seem to hear from U.S. intelligence sources. It's what we've been warning about uh, for days, if not uh, weeks, or at least certainly since that strike against the uh, Iranian consulate in Damascus. Uh, certainly that is a big concern. Intelligence sources, U.S. intelligence sources telling Bloomberg that there is an imminent risk of that strike, be it through a ballistic missile, be it through swarms of explosive drones. That's one of the other avenues we've heard the Iranians may use. So there is certainly a concern. It is front of mind for uh, people here across Israel. Escalation both with Iran directly, but also with its proxies in the north. We've heard the leader of Hezbollah repeatedly saying that uh, that uh, a strike would come. It's not a question of if it comes, it's a question of when and how, and that how is crucial because the Israelis have said very clearly that if Iran strikes Israel directly, uh, it will respond in kind by striking Israel from, uh, striking Iran, I should say, from Israel directly as well. We understand from those uh, intelligence sources speaking to Bloomberg that uh, the, we expect Iran to target either military or government uh, institutions in Israel or around the region, but we don't know exactly when, we don't know exactly what, we don't know exactly how, and that certainly uh, creates a climate of fear and anticipation to see what that retaliation may be. Alex, what more can you tell us about Israel opening a new land crossing into Gaza? Well, it's not entirely clear what uh, that land crossing will look like. We know that they said they would open the ARS checkpoint in the north. The latest information we have is that that is still not open. We understand as well from aid agencies who have slightly disputed Israel's version of events when it comes to those trucks coming in, a record number, 480, according to the Israeli government just yesterday. But aid agencies say that Israeli security checks mean these trucks are not always full. In fact, some of them are only half full, limiting the aid going into Gaza. Clearly, those airdrops ongoing, the largest airdrop in a single day, happened in the last couple of days as well. But the question remains, if those airdrops are necessary, then maybe the road, ch the road routes are clearly not sufficient to get aid into Gaza. There are several challenges. We know that uh, the Israelis think that UN agencies are not supplying enough aid once it gets through, and it's just waiting at the border inside of Gaza. We also know uh, that uh, Hamas has previously uh, uh, stopped convoys of aid from coming in because they were being guarded by Palestinian Authority officials. So there are a lot of challenges, uh, no, particularly the fact that some of the roads have been destroyed by Israeli strikes. So getting the aid to the right places, to the right people, is incredibly challenging. And the military operation by Israel is ongoing. They've attacked uh, New Syria's camp, camp just in the last few hours. The Palestinians say uh, a school was hit. Israel says they were targeting uh, terrorist infrastructure. Clearly, the ongoing conflict, the ongoing war, makes aid delivery still very challenging. All right, we leave it at that. Alex Katia in Tel Aviv, thank you for now. Appreciate it. Now the news, Russia's foreign ministry has strongly recommended its citizens to refrain from traveling to West Asia, especially to Israel, Lebanon and the Palestinian territories, except in cases of extreme necessity. The foreign ministry said the tense situation in West Asia is persistent, though security situation in Jordan remains stable. U.S. President Joe Biden urged Hamas on Wednesday to accept the latest proposal for a temporary ceasefire in Gaza in exchange for the release of hostages. We're not going to stop until we do. The new proposal on the table, uh, Bill Burns led the effort to, uh, for us. We're grateful for his work. There's a now up to Hamas. They need to move on the proposal that's been made. And as I said, uh, we'll get these hostages home where they belong but also bring back a six-week ceasefire that we need now. And the fact is that we're, uh, we're getting in somewhere in the last three days over 100 trucks. It's not enough. 
but it needs to be written more, and there's one more opening that has to take place in the north. So we'll see what he does in terms of meeting the commitments he made to me. For his part, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has made it very clear that the U.S. will stand with Israel against any threat by Iran. Blinken, in a call with Israel's Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, discussed ongoing efforts to secure the release of all hostages through an agreement for an Im immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Right, in some more news, it's been five years since WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange was forcibly expelled from the Ecuadorian embassy in London into the hands of waiting British police officers. Since then, he has been fighting extradition to the United States from an English prison on multiple charges of espionage. But his time in the UK could be close to an end, as Stuart Smith reports from London. After a series of appeal hearings, next week is the deadline for the US Justice Department to assure the High Court in London that Julian Assange will be treated fairly if deported to the US. If it doesn't provide those assurances, he'll be granted an appeal in Britain in May. Assange has been wanted by American authorities since 2019 for allegedly repeatedly violating the US Espionage Act, and he's been held at a British maximum security prison since then. His website, WikiLeaks, hosted tens of thousands of classified documents related to America's military and diplomatic activities worldwide. His supporters say the charges are politically motivated, and his conviction would represent an assault on freedom of speech and freedom of the press. The International Federation of Journalists, as well as press giants in the US, UK, France, Germany and Spain, have called for his release. But the US Justice Department says the publishing of some of those documents endangered the lives of informants. They claim he should not be treated as an ordinary journalist and that WikiLeaks was not an ordinary publisher. At court earlier in the year, they claimed Assange sought to solicit, steal and indiscriminately publish US government documents and he should be punished. England's High Court judges found the 52-year-old Australian can be extradited to the US to face justice there, but only if the US government can prove he will be treated fairly. It has until next week to provide those assurances, or he will be entitled to appeal this extradition. The US government must convince the court that he is afforded the same First Amendment protections as a United States citizen, which protects freedom of speech, and that the death penalty will not be imposed. Stuart Smith in London, reporting for DD India. Still to come on DD India News Hour. US President Joe Biden hosts Japan's Prime Minister Kishida Fumio for a state dinner at the White House. Former US President Donald Trump's hush money case to go on trial on 15th April after judge rejects his appeal. In South Korea, President Yoon suk yeols ruling party suffers a resounding blow in legislative election. Paul Pulse tracks the pulse of the pole-bound southernmost Indian state of Tamil Nadu. Voting is our responsibility. This is a big fight between uh, BJP and uh, India Alliance. Will you vote? Ah, vote on. We are power of democracy. This is a huge. BJP is trying her best, you know, for the past 10 years under the flagship of uh, Sri Narendra Modi Garden. The 2024 Lok Sabha polls in Tamil Nadu are witnessing the battle royale between DMK, AIA DMK and the BJP. You're watching DD India News Hour. I'm Ramesh Ramachandran. US President Joe Biden and the First Lady hosted Japanese Prime Minister Kishida Fumio and his wife for a state dinner at the White House. During a toast at the dinner, Biden said that the alliance between the two countries is stronger than ever. Kishida further emphasized Biden's sentiment, asserting that despite the Pacific Ocean between the two nations, the pioneering spirit of those who came before us had united them. I was saying, Japan and the United States, 
many, we may be divided by distance, but the generations after generation, we've been brought together with the same hopes, the same values, the same commitment to democracy and freedom and to dignity, dignity for all. And today, without question, our alliance is literally stronger than it has ever been. And the United States are united than ever before. I believe that the Pacific Ocean has brought Japan and the United States together and so close because of the pioneering spirit of those who came before us and frontier spirit that we all have in common. Kishida will also address the U.S. Congress on Thursday before joining Biden and Philippines President for a trilateral meeting. U.S. President Biden is hosting the leaders of the Philippines and Japan on Thursday, a day after he held a bilateral summit with the visiting Japanese leader. The three countries are expected to talk about economic ties and to lock in defense deals they see as crucial in securing the Indo-Pacific. Caroline Malone reports from Washington, D.C. It was clear from Wednesday's White House events between U.S. President Biden and Japanese Prime Minister Kishida that the two are similarly aligned in wanting to forge a positive alliance in the Indo-Pacific to secure a prosperous and safe region. To do that, they've announced key defense deals with the promise of more to come. Under his leadership, Japan set in motion profound changes in its defense policies and its capabilities. Now, now our two countries are building a stronger defense partnership and a stronger Indo stronger Indo-Pacific than ever before. As a global partner, Japan will join hands with our American friends and together we will lead the way in tackling the challenges of the Indo-Pacific and the world. Looking ahead toward the world will be like 10 years, 100 years and now, while tirelessly developing the relationships between our countries. And ahead of Thursday's trilateral between the US and Japan and the Philippines, President Marcos said he sees the focus of meetings being on strengthening economic relations, but also on security. That, he said, the main intent of this trilateral is for us to be able to continue to flourish, to be able to help one another, and of course, to keep the peace in the South China Sea and the freedom of navigation. The US, Japan, and the Philippines, along with Australia, held military drills in the South China Sea over the weekend. Before those exercises, the four countries said they intend to uphold the right to freedom of navigation and respect maritime rights under international law, the implication of all of this is that they want to ward off increasingly assertive actions from China in the South China Sea. Well, President Biden said, alongside Japanese Prime Minister Kishida on Wednesday, that he will be welcoming another friend to the White House on Thursday, a sign of the warmer ties that are strengthening between all three countries. Caroline Malone in Washington for Didi India. Meanwhile, former U.S. President Donald Trump's criminal hush money case is set to go on trial on 15th April as a New York appeals judge on Wednesday denied Trump's third last-ditch attempt to delay, paving the way for the first-ever trial of a former U.S. president. During an earlier hearing, Trump lawyer Emil Bove said the trial should be delayed because Justice Juan Merkin who is overseeing the case, has not yet ruled on their request for him to recuse himself. The case is one of four criminal indictments Trump faces as he prepares to challenge Democratic President Joe Biden in their 5th November U.S. election rematch. He has sought to delay proceedings in all cases until after the election, and the hush money case is the only one with a firm trial date. The decision from the Arizona Supreme Court on Tuesday pushed the abortion issue at center of 2024 presidential election in November. Democrats wasted little time capitalizing on Tuesday's ruling from Arizona's high court, upholding a 160-year-old abortion ban, organizing press conferences in swing states across the country and blaming former Republican President Donald Trump for eliminating a nationwide right to abortion.
In addition, abortion rights advocates are working to put a ballot measure before voters in November that would enshrine abortion rights protections into the Arizona state constitution. Meanwhile, Trump, seeking to distance himself from the ruling, said on Wednesday that the court had gone too far even while defending the U.S. Supreme Court decision that permitted states to restrict abortion. He called on the state's Republican-controlled legislature and Democratic governor to amend the law. And shifting focus to the Indo-Pacific now, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un on Thursday said unstable geopolitical situations surrounding his country mean now is the time to be more prepared for war than ever as he inspected the country's main military university. Kim gave field guidance on Wednesday at Kim Jong-il University of Military and Politics and met with university staff and students alike. North Korea has stepped up weapons development in recent years under Kim and has forced closer military and political ties with Russia, allegedly aiding Moscow in its war with Ukraine in return for help with strategic military projects. South Korea's President Yoon suk yeols ruling party suffered a resounding blow in legislative election held on Wednesday. The country's Liberal Opposition Party scored a landslide victory but fell just short of a super-majority. The main opposition, Democratic Party and its satellite party won a combined 175 seats in the 300-seat parliament. Meanwhile, following the drubbing, Yoon, Prime Minister Han duk Su, and other senior aides tendered their resignation. The election setback is likely to further tie his hands domestically. The National Elections Commission is expected to confirm the final results later on Thursday. And DD India's Chris Gilbert has more from Tokyo. This is a significant setback uh, for the PPP, for Yoon suk yeols party. He is now set to become the first ever South Korean president to do a five-year term with no party control uh, over the National Assembly at all. And so that effectively, as experts would say, makes him a lame duck for the rest of the uh, three years of his term. Uh, he was, of course, elected uh, into a situation which had an opposition Democratic Party controlled parliament, and now it is the status quo. It looks to have become, uh, you know, a, a stronger hold on the uh, parliament for uh, the Democratic Party. President Yoon suk yeol has already come out and said that he accepts the results of the election, and he is looking ahead. He's saying that he wants to now focus on stabilizing the lives. Uh, of the people of South Korea and stabilizing the economy. Uh, obviously, this is a terrible situation politically uh, for the PPP. They may, there may have to be some soul searching and, and some regrouping that they uh, are going to have to do. Uh, there also is going to be some analysis of how the uh, constituency and the demographics in South Korea are changing, um, especially considering that you know what has traditionally been a very bipartisan country is now becoming less so with experts saying about 30 percent um, of the electorate uh, is was undecided uh, or perhaps a, a newly emerged swing voter going into this uh, election which you know with the analysis in the days and weeks to come may show uh, you know, that is the reason behind some of the strength of the dp's win um, but you know for yun suk yeol the, the pressure is going to be on maintaining uh, his message for south korea on the global stage especially well for the relations with japan especially relations with the united states when he doesn't have any control over the parliament for the parliament it means they're going to have to focus on their agenda but they don't have the power to veto Yun suk yeols veto. So there are some challenges ahead. In some more news from the Indo-Pacific, thousands of people in Myanmar were heading to Thailand on Thursday as hundreds of military personnel withdrew to a bridge connecting the border town of Miyawadi with Thailand. The retreat of junta troops in Miyawadi after days of fighting to Thailand's Mesot city has signaled the potential loss of another key border trading outpost with direct highway access to parts of central Myanmar. The Southeast Asian nation's military-run government is battling armed rebel groups on several fronts. However, the border crossings remain open for civilians who have been entering Thailand from Myanmar in large numbers. 
According to officials, almost 4,000 people have crossed into the Thai border town each day in the last few days. And now take a look at some more stories making news around the world. Chinese pianist Lang Lang has been honored with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in Los Angeles. Lang Lang, who has sold millions of albums, said receiving the star on the Californian city's storied Hollywood Boulevard was the absolute highlight of his life so far. Items from the life and career of Tony Bennett are hitting the auction block. Julian's Auctions is hosting a two-day sale on April 18 and 19 to celebrate the life and career of the jazz vocalist at Lincoln Center's Ertugun Jazz Hall of Fame in New York City. The auction will feature items from Bennett's eight-decade-long career, including personal belongings, original artwork and memorabilia. Musician Paul Simon played for Japanese Prime Minister Kishida Fumio, his wife, U.S. President Joe Biden and the First Lady Jill Biden at a state dinner at the White House on Wednesday. Simon, one of Jill Biden's favorite artists, was chosen as a special tribute to Kishida because he shares her appreciation for Simon's work, her office said. The Rio de Janeiro government has deployed a multi-varied set of measures to halt the spread of dengue as Brazil is fighting a record outbreak that has killed over 1,100 people this year. The Secretary of Health has rolled out a strategy to release into the air lab-bred mosquitoes with the Wolbachia bacteria to reduce the transmission of mosquito-borne viral diseases such as dengue. And still to come on DD India News Hour. Floods ravage Russia and Kazakhstan after Europe's third longest river bursts its banks. AU Parliament approves migration system revamp ahead of the bloc's election. And the latest update on India's general election as campaigning reaches feverish pitch. Opposition stuns Erdogan with historic victory in Turkish local poll. Will the defeat force Erdogan to reset his foreign policy? Will artificial intelligence enslave humans? And crypto king Sam Bankman Fried will grow old in jail. So, what lessons should we learn from his conviction? Watch Connecting the Dots to get the full picture every Friday at 8 p.m. IST on DD India. You're watching DD India News Hour. I'm Ramesh Ramachandran. A quick recap of the headlines. Asian Development Bank raises India's GDP growth forecast for the current fiscal to 7% investment and consumer demand to drive the robust growth. The leaders of Japan and the US announced stronger defense ties with an eye on countering growing threat from China and deterring any attempt to seize Taiwan. And India celebrates Eid al-Fitr marking the end of the fasting month of Ramzan. Prime Minister Narendra Modi greets people on the occasion. Russia staged a major missile and drone strike on Ukrainian energy infrastructure early on Thursday, damaging substations and power facilities in five regions and causing emergency power cuts for at least 200,000 people. Kyiv officials said that an overnight attack damaged substations and power facilities in five regions including Odessa, Kharkiv, Zaporizhia, Lviv and Kyiv, causing emergency power cuts. The latest attack used 82 missiles and drones. Ukraine's air defense took uh, down 18 of the incoming missiles and 39 drones. Russian strikes also attacked two Ukraine underground gas storage facilities. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky will visit Lithuania's capital Vilnius on Thursday. Ukrainian stocks of air defenses and artillery have dwindled as assistance from the West has slowed down 
and a major U.S. aid package has been blocked by Republican lawmakers in the country's legislature. Meanwhile, UN Nuclear Watchdog's Board of Governors will hold an emergency meeting on Thursday at the request of both Ukraine and Russia to discuss attacks on the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant after the enemies accused each other of the drone attacks. The IAEA has said drones struck the Russian-held facility in southern Ukraine on Sunday, hitting one reactor building. It has not ascribed blame but has demanded such attacks stop. Russia had said that Ukraine had again attacked the plant with drones for a third day. Kyiv said it had nothing to do with any such attacks and any incidents were staged by Moscow. Now, Russia and Ukraine have repeatedly accused one another of targeting Zaporizhia since it was captured by Russian forces in the first weeks of Moscow's invasion of its neighbour in 2022. Both sides deny attacking it. Now, all reactors are shut down at Europe's largest nuclear power station, located near the Ukraine war's front line, but it requires constant power to cool the reactors and prevent a potentially catastrophic meltdown. The Swiss government said will host, it will host a two-day high-level conference in June aimed at achieving peace in Ukraine. The conference will be held on 15th and 16th of June at the Burgenstock Resort in the canton of Nidwalden, outside the city of Lucerne. It will aim to create a framework favourable to a comprehensive and lasting peace in Ukraine, as well as a concrete roadmap for Russia's participation in the peace process. Although Russia has made it clear that it will not take part in this initiative. Meanwhile, floods continue to engulf cities and towns across Russia and Kazakhstan after Europe's third longest river burst its banks. The water level continues to rise in flood zones while large amounts of water are coming to new regions. The Kremlin says the forecast is unfavorable. More than 100,000 people have been evacuated so far from the affected regions. Upstream on the Ural, which flows into Kazakhstan, floodwaters burst through an embankment dam in the city of Orsk on Friday. Unusual floods that have gripped cities and towns in both countries can be explained by the heavy accumulation of snow during the winter and the speed at which it melts because of climate change. In the U.S., severe storms are battering parts of south with the torrential rains and life-threatening flooding as well. Drone footage showed flooding in Belton, Texas as storms swept the state. The National Weather Service issued severe thunderstorm watch warning Texans of large hail and strong damaging winds. Local police closed multiple roads because of the floods. Meanwhile, police and fire department conducted rescue operations after a tornado left a trail of destruction through the U.S. state of Louisiana on Wednesday. More than 30,000 homes and businesses suffered power outages after the tornado struck Louisiana City, Slidell. Roads were littered with tree limbs and debris. Roofs of buildings were also partially ripped off. Canada risks another catastrophic wildfire season as it uh, forecasted higher than normal spring and summer temperatures across much of the country. Last year, Canada endured its worst ever fire season with more than 6,000 blazes burning 15 million hectares, an area roughly seven times the annual average. Eight firefighters died and 230,000 people were evacuated from their homes. This winter, the country experienced warmer than normal temperatures and widespread drought, setting the stage for another punishing summer. In other news, European lawmakers have approved a revised immigration system on Wednesday in an effort to thwart gains made by the far right ahead of the bloc's legislative election in June. Reducing undesired immigration from the Middle East and Africa is a top concern for the EU bloc, and its goal is to shorten the time it takes for security and asylum procedures at external EU borders while also increasing returns. However, Far-right, anti-immigration and Eurosceptic parties have harshly attacked it for not going far enough to halt migration, while socialists and human rights advocates have denounced it as a serious setback to human rights. The European Parliament has just voted in favour of a new way forward on asylum and migration. We have listened 
we have acted and we have delivered on one of the main concerns of people across Europe. This is a historic day uh, for Europe. I want to thank members of the European Parliament who have spent years working on this. The European Parliament voted on Wednesday to pass a law to reduce carbon dioxide emissions from trucks. The move will require most new heavy-duty vehicles sold in the EU from 2040 to be emissions-free. The law will enforce a 90% cut in CO2 emissions from new heavy-duty vehicles by the year 2040. To attempt to pull the transport sector in line with climate change targets, truck manufacturers will also have to reduce the CO2 emissions of their fleets 45% by 2030 and 65% by 2035. The policy still needs final approval from EU countries, a step that is usually a formality and approves a law with no changes. Meanwhile, campaigners are demanding higher taxes on the ultra-wealthy, saying it could raise up to $286 billion for the European Union's most vulnerable. The protesters say that they will land a private jet in front of the European Parliament in protest on Thursday. But the claim could just be a marketing gimmick for the bigger cause. Ishan Garg has more from Brussels. Campaigners will gather outside the European Parliament building in Brussels demanding a 2 to 5 percent progressive tax on the ultra rich. They say it could pay for up to 40 percent of the EU's post pandemic recovery fund. Global NGO Oxfam says the EU's five richest billionaires have boosted their wealth by 76 percent since 2020. They claim 99 percent of the European population has become relatively poorer in the same time period. A study commissioned by the EU's executive arm has found that a progressive wealth tax on the bloc's richest 0.5 percent could generate more than $200 billion every year. NGOs including Oxfam, Avaaz and We Move Europe are organizing Thursday's protest. They claim they will land a jet in Luxembourg Square in the heart of the Belgian capital in the middle of the narrow cobbled streets leading up to the European Parliament building. Now, this stunt, which is unlikely to happen in practice, is supposed to be a commentary on how the ultra-wealthy are hurting the environment by flying in private planes. The campaigners are hoping to raise awareness about climate change and will lobby European lawmakers to bring in laws to tax big individual polluters. Organizers say the ultra-wealthy and their companies paying far too little tax is at the core of many of Europe's problems. During this protest, they will demand more measures to address billionaires allegedly using shell companies to evade tax. They say urgent action by authorities is required to reduce the wealth gap between the bloc's richest and poorest. Ishan Gurg in Brussels, reporting for DD India. The Asian Development Bank has raised India's GDP growth forecast for the financial year 24-25 to 7% from its previous projection of 6.7% in December last year. According to the ADB's April edition of the Asian Development Outlook 2024 report released on Thursday, the robust growth will be driven by strong public and private sector investment, strong services sector and improved consumer demand. The ADB said that the Indian economy grew remarkably in 22-23 fiscal year with strong momentum in manufacturing and services. The ADB's growth forecast for FY25 is in line with the projections made by the Reserve Bank of India, which had projected a 7% GDP growth rate in the current fiscal year. Right, let's now get you the latest on the world's largest democratic election in India. Election season is at its peak in India with parties organizing multiple public meetings as the first phase of voting is slated for the 19th of this month. In a bit to bolster support for the ruling BJP, Prime Minister Modi addressed an election rally in Rishikesh in the northern Indian state of Uttarakhand. During his speech, PM Modi criticized the Congress party accusing it of misappropriating funds intended for the welfare of the poor and youth. कांग्रेस की सरकार थी तो गरीब का नौजवान का पैसा 
बिचौलिए खा जाते थे भाजपा सरकार लोगों के हक का पैसा सीधे उनके बैंक खाते में ट्रांसफर कर रहा है उत्तराखंड के किसानों को पीएम किसान सम्मान निधि का 2600 करोड़ रूपये से अधिक उनके खाते में जमा हो चुके हैं कांग्रेस की सरकार होती वे सब कुछ लूट जाता ये लूट मोदी ने बंद की है और इसलिए मोदी पर उनका गुस्सा सातवें आसमान पर है एंड लेटर इन द डे पीएम मोदी विल होल्ड अ रैली इन राजस्थान ढोलपुर Now, not only PM Modi but several BJP star campaigners are holding campaigns to attract voters. Senior BJP leader and Home Minister Amit Shah held a public rally in Mandala city of Central Indian state of Madhya Pradesh. Later in the day, he will hold rallies in Khajuraho and Nanded cities as well. Defence Minister Rajnath Singh visited Madhya Pradesh and held a public meeting in Morgan city of the state. To garner support in party's favour, BJP President J.P. Nadda will also hold address an election rally in Port Blair in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Minister V. Murli Dharan on Thursday accused Kerala CPIM of threatening him during his election campaign ahead of the Lok Sabha election. The minister alleged that the CPIM goons even attempted to attack the campaign vehicle and hurled abuses at him. Posting a video of three men on a bike attempting to assault the minister, Murli Dharan took to X and wrote, "I will not be intimidated by the goons of CPIM Kerala who threatened me during the campaign and even attempted to attack the campaign vehicle." The opposition party is also going all, all out to woo the voters. Congress leader Rahul Gandhi visited Rajasthan on Thursday. He held public rallies in Bikaner to garner support for the party candidates. Bikaner will go to the polls in the first phase on April 19, while Jodhpur polling will take place on the 26th of April. Meanwhile, Congress leaders K C Venu Gopal and Ramesh Chennitala held election campaign in Alappuzha city in the southern Indian state of Kerala. Congress General Secretary K C Venu Gopal to contest the 24 election from Alappuzha Lok Sabha constituency. And joining me is my colleague Akshay Dongri. Akshay, what more can you tell us about uh, the rallies by star campaigners of various political parties, including PM Modi's rally in Rishikesh? Well, uh, from uh, the the past uh, elections as well, what we have seen uh, ahead of the election uh, uh, election season is the fact that all of the political parties uh, try to reach out uh, to their voter bases, especially uh, the promises uh, and the work of uh, the the parties that are in power. Uh, it it becomes essential for these political parties uh, who remain in power to highlight the work that has been done during the tenure. Uh, as far as uh, these uh, rallies are concerned, uh, they are being held by the opposition leaders uh, in, in the areas where they want to voters consolidate their voter base. Uh, by uh, the ruling Bharatiya Janata Party, Prime Minister Narendra Modi and other star campaigners are in fact trying to reach out to each and every part of the country. Uh, uh, you know taking the message of the work that the the party has done as far as uh, the past 10 years are concerned during which the bharatiya janata party has been in the power at, at the center uh, as far as uh, the other uh, core issues uh, that uh, the opposition has been highlighted uh, that they feel that have not been completed they they in fact reach out to the public uh, highlighting the work that they feel that the government could have done the government in fact uh, goes uh, rather uh, on the other hand uh, the government goes uh, to the to the public uh, speaking about uh, the work Uh, that they have done, in fact, in the past uh, 10 years, and this is uh, the kind of uh, every time uh, there is our elections, uh, this is uh, a, a normal uh, pr procedure that the political parties go through. Uh, however, what uh, what is interesting this time around, uh, rather, is is the fact that how uh, the Bharatiya Janata Party, after 10 years, will try to beat the anti-incumbency. As far as uh, the opposition is concerned, how they will try to highlight that uh, the the people should uh, elect them 
uh, and why should uh, the Bharatiya Janata Party uh, uh, should be voted out? Uh, that has been the agenda of the opposition. In fact, the Bharatiya Janata Party, on the other hand, goes out to the public uh, with uh, their own promises of uh, their their roadmap for the next uh, next next tenure uh, uh, is concerned of the Lok Sabha of the central uh, central government. So all of these promises will be made uh, through the manifestos, uh, while uh, the opposition has already announced uh, their manifesto, their promises uh, that they, they seek to fulfill. Uh, the uh, Bharatiya Janata Party has taken about uh, 500,000 suggestions from people through missed calls, through various applications. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, one of the most important application in this process was uh, the uh, application of Prime Minister Narendra Modi, in which uh, uh, suggestions were sought from the public on what they think uh, should be the priority issues uh, for the government in, in the next five years which go on to show that how uh, all the political parties across the specter are trying to uh, woo the voters and trying to uh, consolidate their voter base and trying to win over the states that can be considered uh, uh, swing states in India as far as uh, the political atmosphere is concerned. For example, West Bengal, where uh, while uh, in the Legislative Assembly, a local regional party, Trinamool Congress, uh, is, is victorious, is, is running the government, but when it comes to uh, the uh, Lok Sabha elections or, or, or the General Assembly elections, uh, like in 2019, it, it can churn out a lot of surprises. So the focus also remains on these uh, states as well uh, to, uh, in fact, uh, uh, churn out as much as uh, seeds uh, from from the election process right. through rallies, through through promises, and through campaigning and canvassing that is done by the start campaigners. All right, we'll leave it at that. Akshay Dongri, thank you. Appreciate it. India celebrates Eid with great fervor and gaiety on Thursday, marking the end of the fasting month of Ramzan. Prime Minister Modi extends his Eid wishes to mark the occasion. Taking to the social media platform X, PM Modi said, and I quote, Best wishes on Eid al-Fitr. May this occasion further spread the spirit of compassion, togetherness and peace. May everyone be happy and healthy. Eid Mubarak, unquote. And now take a look at some other stories making news in India. A terrorist has been killed in an encounter with security forces in India's Jammu and Kashmir. Security forces launched a cordon and search operation at Rajpura area of uh, South Kashmir following inputs about the presence of terrorists there. India's National Investigation Agency has arrested one person in a case relating to extortion by the People's Liberation Front of India members following massive raids across two states in coordination with the state police forces. Raids and searches were conducted on Wednesday by multiple NIA teams with the help of local police at two locations in Jharkhand and two in Assam following complaints of extortion by PLFI members to raise funds from traders, contractors and business persons. After Enforcement Directorate, India's Central Bureau of Investigation has arrested BRS leader K. Kavitha in Tihar jail in the Delhi excise policy probe on Thursday. The CBI had informed the Delhi court that they had questioned her in the jail on Wednesday. And still to come on DD India News Hour. Tesla CEO Elon Musk to visit India this month to call on Prime Minister Narendra Modi. And in a first, World Athletics announces prize money for track and field gold medalists at this year's Paris Olympics. Regional parties call the shots in the Northeast. Will local issues play high over national issues? Will Sikkim, Meghalaya and Arunachal Pradesh go with the tried and tested? Or will they look for change? On the great Indian election, what are the issues that matter in the three northeastern states? On Thursday at 8.30 p.m. IST and 1500 hours GMT, only on DD India. As India decides in the world's largest election, we help you feel the pulse of the nation. I am Sakal Bhatt. I am Shubhain Dukhosh. This election season, join us on a journey of India. Discover the colours of democracy. Watch Pool Pulse 
on DT India. We just don't bring you the news as it unfolds. We get to the heart of the matter. We don't just present facts. We demystify complex social, political and economic events. We break stories that shape the world's present and future because you deserve the truth. I am Tanvi Taneja from New Delhi. I'm Oli Barrett from London. I'm Nick Harper from Washington DC. Join us on DD India Global Monday to Friday at these times. You're watching DD India News Hour. I'm Ramesh Ramachandran. Tesla CEO Elon Musk confirmed a visit to India after he said he looked forward to meeting PM Modi in the country in a post on X. Musk has, however, not revealed details of when the visit is likely to happen. The SpaceX founder is likely to announce the company's investment plans in the country. The announcement of the billionaire's visit comes less than a month after India had announced a new electric vehicle policy which would cut taxes by as much as 85% on imports of a certain number of EVs. And now to all the news in the world of sport with my colleague Deepika. Deepika, over to you. Thanks and good afternoon. First, let's tell our viewers the big news that we are receiving from World Athletics. Well, Athletics is now set to become the first sport to introduce prize money at the upcoming Paris Olympics with the World Athletics body saying on Wednesday that it would pay $50,000 to 48 gold medalists in Paris. The move is a symbolic break with the amateur past of the Olympics in one of the game's most watched events. In the modern Olympics, which started in 1896 in Athens, athletes have not received prize money from the International Olympic Committee. The prize money will come out of the share of Olympic re revenue that the IOC distributes to the World Athletics. A total of $540 million was allocated to the 28 spots at the Tokyo Games, with World Athletics receiving the most at $40 million. Spanish club Barcelona beat French club Paris Saint-Germain by 3-2 on Wednesday in the first leg of their Champions League quarter-final clash. Brazil forward Rapina scored twice to help Barcelona secure victory at Paris Saint-Germain in a lively match. Barcelona have earned their first victory in the knockout stage in four years. PSG forward Kylian Mbappe was nowhere to be found as five times European champions, Barcelona managed to neutralize France's captain. The hosts came into the match unbeaten in their last 27 games in all competitions but were undone by a fired-up Barcelona side looking forward to return to the club to the summit of European football. One of the things I am most proud of is that we have shown strong personality in the face of difficulty and that is very important in this competition and something we struggled with over the last few years. We did very well. All the players put in extraordinary <coughs> shift tonight. That's what I'm most proud of. This hasn't finished yet. We are just in the middle of the movie. Yes, it is true that we have an advantage. It is a great away win in Europe. It's a moment to be proud of, but this is not over. We have a very difficult match to play in Barcelona next Tuesday. On to cricket now. In IPL, Mumbai Indians will take on Royal Challengers Bengaluru in the 25th match of Indian Premier League in Mumbai. Well, Mumbai, after losing their first three matches, had their first victory on Sunday, defeating Delhi. For a side that invariably starts IPL with a few number of losses, Mumbai Indians know their way around these lanes. A contest against a floundering RCB could bring about their second victory on the trot and some further boost of their confidence as well. On the on the other hand, Royal Challengers Bangaluru are not having their results in their favour. Faftu Pelesi's led side is coming off three straight losses, two of which came at their home ground. Having the best of batters on their side, the bowling has been the issue for their losses, so it remains to be seen how the teams are going to pad up tonight. 
On to chess now. At candidates' 2024 tournament in chess, India's R. Pragnananda and Vidit Gujarati scored full points in round number six of the candidates' tournament. Prague inflicted a second consecutive defeat on Nijat Abasov, while Vidit Gujarati got the better off of an overly daring Aliriza Ferosa. The remaining two games ended drawn. That leaves D. Kukesh and Eon still tied for first place in the standings. With this, Pragnananda now stands a half point back with as many points as Fibienu. In Thursday's seventh round, the last one before the second rest day, co leaders D. Kukesh and Eon will both play with the black pieces against the ever dangerous Firoza and Hikaru Nakamura, respectively. So that was a quick wrap from the world of sports. Back to you. Thank you, Deepika. And with that, it's a wrap on this edition of DD India News. I'll let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X and Instagram. You can also check out our website, ddindia.co.in. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Ramesh Ramachandran. From all of us here in New Delhi, thanks for watching DD India News Hour.